You're clean, aren't you? Except for your tower. You're a tower junkie, Roland. Hello and welcome to Tower Junkies, presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. Tower Junkies is a podcast celebrating the work of Stephen King with an occasional focus on his magnum opus, The Dark Tower series. We discuss the themes, characters, and mythology of the series in Palaver episodes and review the books and comic series in Kef episodes. We also discuss non-Tower King novels, TV and film adaptations of King's work, and the latest news about all things that serve the King. You can find more of our work at TowerJunkiesPod.com. You can also like us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash TowerJunkiesPod and follow us on every level of social media, which by that I mean... Twitter and Instagram um, at Tower Junkies Pod. Um, and if you'd like to support what we do here, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash obsessive viewer, which covers all three of the podcasts that we host. Um, basically, if you pay, if you, if you pledge $1 per month, you get access to exclusive B-roll episodes that we, we record before each episode recording, where we just kind of bullshit and talk and everything. Uh, sometimes it's funny and sometimes it's entertaining. Um, anyway, uh, that's a terrible way to sell Good it sell. thank you um <laughs> uh for two dollars a month you get that plus um exclusive tv uh reviews and reaction video uh, reaction recordings um i do weekly reviews uh, weekly of uh Lisey story <laughs> loki i've done reviews of rutherford fall season one super sore the complete series and uh i'll be doing what if uh, marvel's sh- show uh next month and then also if you are if you choose to pledge $5 per month, you get all of what I've said before, plus movie commentary tracks that I record, um, you know, infrequently. And then finally, at $10 a month, you get all of that, plus early access to podcast episodes and previously unreleased content. Uh, we have had our... Uh, I, I posted our... Um, previous episode of the podcast a few days in advance on patreon for ten dollars um yeah so i mean it's up there so cool yeah so that's patreon patreon.com slash obsessive viewer and uh i am your host matt hurt and with me today as usual i'm one of your hosts matt hurt i always forget to make that distinction (laughs) sorry tiny okay um uh, and with me today is tiny how's it going tiny yellow it's good hi good 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 um yeah pizza is uh Pizza check in is that she is chewing the storage thing that I have hanging on the door. She is. Um, yeah, it's really creepy because uh, I'll leave my door open for, to my bedroom, um, and <laughs> like I'll just be laying in bed or I'll be sitting on the couch. No, 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 I'll be sitting in my room because the, the way the door is. Um, and she'll like she'll do that. She'll like jump up onto the little uh, container thing, and it'll just slowly close the door. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> it's like it's kind of creepy, but it's yeah, funny. for real. Yeah, so, I don't know. Anyway, hopefully that doesn't cause a bowel obstruction. So, <laughs> um, today on the podcast, guys, we I'm, I'm very excited for this episode because we are uh, reviewing the final two episodes of Apple TV Plus's adaptation of the novel Lisey's Story. So, today we're going to be discussing... Um, no Light, No Spark, and Lisey's Story, the final two episodes of Lisey's Story. Each episode premiered, uh, respectively, on Apple TV Plus on July 9th and July 16th. Um, so yeah, so we have watched them, and we are going to get this episode posted as soon as the finale airs, which I'm excited about as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so Tiny, um, before we get into the reviews and everything, uh, Stevie King news and check-ins. Oh, yeah, we were just here. We were just here. We literally just recorded episode 64, uh, two days ago, 48 hours ago. Mm-hmm. Um, any check-ins? <laughs> Have you listened to any more of Needful Things? I haven't actually. Nice. Me just... neither, weirdly enough. Yeah, I've been working locally, so I haven't really uh, had a long drive or anything. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Um, I will get back up on it uh in the next few days i think um i'm actually excited because i got new i ordered new wireless headphones uh for work oh sweet yeah well yeah um i'm excited about it but also hesitant because i've had bad experience with cheap ones yeah but also it's just it's annoying to me because i the earbuds that i had were like the like the ones that came with a phone and they worked fine they worked great Mm -hmm. um and then it seems to do this. Like this seems to happen with earbuds all the time with me. 
but maybe this is maybe this is actually a medical condition but um <laughs> suddenly like one of them 9 times out of 10 it's the right earbud uh-huh. will get like incredibly low like like it, it'll start to lose the audio huh. like and so it's like it's it's frustrating that's weird yeah yeah so huh. i recently got some new earbuds too oh nice i have the um oh, i don't know what, how you describe them but it's like a like a little thing that like lays on your neck and then uh, they're on a cord and they you put them in mm-hmm. that way. I don't know how to explain it really or <laughs> if there's a be, term for those. I don't know. I was going to be a dick and say, you just described headphones. <laughs> <laughs> you put these things on your well, ears and there's a cord. <laughs> no, they're like a, cause it's for, a, it's for like a microphone for your phones as well. Oh, okay. And so like, that's the microphone part. It's the thing that like hangs around your neck. Oh, okay. And then there's a cord that the earbuds are attached to that. And then you can take those off and just let them hang or you can put them in. Oh, gotcha. Um, I don't know how to explain it, but, uh, okay. I think I'm, I'm putting, I'm picking up what you're putting down. Gotcha. So I um, used to have yeah. a version of those and it was like, I got like cheap ones mm-hmm. that were like 25 bucks. Yeah. And they, and like, I want them for making phone calls cause I'm on the phone a lot at work. Oh yeah. Um, and so I couldn't use it cause like I, the first day I got them, I made several calls and everybody was like, I, I can't hear you. I don't oh, know geez. what you're saying. And so I was like, well, shit, I guess I can't use them for this. Right. Um, and then I'll use them for oh. music and shit like that, podcasts while I'm working sometimes. Oh, um, and so I finally sprung for new ones and I spent like $55 on like some good ones. Nice. And I should have done that from the get go. Oh, yeah. Because as far as being at work, it's so much better because I can, like, I work with my hands. And if I'm sitting there holding something or doing Mm -hmm. something with my hands and my phone rings, it's annoying because I have to stop what I'm doing, try to hold the phone, put the phone on speaker. Mm -hmm. That's not always a good idea because there's people around. Right. And so this way, I just throw in my earbud and hit the button and I'm just like, hey, hello. Mm -hmm. And it's so much better. Why? No, no, I was just, You're laughing at me. No, no, I'm not laughing at you. That's great. I, I was just, I had this idea. I just, I just came up with this idea <laughs> that I think would be really fun <laughs> to do for like an April Fool's episode. <laughs> <laughs> like, what if we, and this, this is going to sound like a backhanded, um, <laughs> like insult, but what if we did a, an April Fool's episode on one of the podcasts or all of them? I don't know. Where we say like, okay, on this episode, we're going to be talking about um, uh, The Colorado Kid by Stephen King. And then <laughs> the, the literally the entire episode would be us just getting on tangents and never talking about the book. <laughs> I feel like you've had that idea before. Probably. Yeah. Uh, I've had that idea before. I've <laughs> accidentally done that before. <laughs> it's a fine line. Right, right. Um, <laughs> But that would, and they just never call attention to it. Just say yeah, like, "Oh, right. we've run out of time." All right, too. Our that was our to review. The Colorado kid. That was yeah, our review. Yeah. <laughs> Funny. So dumb. But anyways, yeah. But yeah. It's, it's much better to buy the nicer stuff because it actually nice. works a lot better. So it's been a game changer. Nice. Yeah. The headphones that I ordered, they're coming in tomorrow. I think they're only like forty bucks. Oh, well, that's not bad. It's not bad. Cheap is like. 20 25 oh, yeah. like that's those are the ones that i had and they they sucked the alec bluetooth earbud headphones were that gotcha. i spent 15 bucks oh Cause, yeah yeah because i was like well okay i can spend a lot of money on one set of um no, can, like relatively a lot of money on a set of wireless like bluetooth headphones um or I can get two of these super cheap ones <laughs> so that I can constantly have one of them fully charged. <laughs> gotcha. Um, and yeah, that did not work out that well. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yep. So yep. mine are Anchor, A-N-K-E-R. Okay, yeah. A really good electronics brand. Nice. Their, I... uh, their phone chargers and like co- charging cords are all I buy. Yes, okay. They're really good. Because I, I remembered, I, I, know that, I know that brand name, and then I just remembered that it... Uh, because I was very obsessed with making sure I had enough battery power on my phones. Yeah. Uh, so, like, my, like, spare batteries when I had removable batteries <laughs> yeah. on my phones were, like, Anchor. Okay. Right? Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I their, All their stuff is awesome. Nice. I love Anchor. Yeah. Nice. Well, speaking of Anchor, let's uh, let's lift the Anchor on our own <laughs> Hollyhocks of an adventure nice. boat. Um, Segway. And, yes. Which is terrible because... That segue is not apt because I have uh, not news, but I have like tweets I want to share. <laughs> okay. So before we get to the Hollyhocks and to Booyah Moon and to the last two episodes of Lisey's story, um, since we have, since we did just record 48 hours ago, 
There's not much in terms of Stephen King news or check-ins or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, however, I, I didn't watch this, but the trailer for uh, the Epics series starring, I think, is it Ethan Hawke? Um, oh, God, I should have really brought this up. Um, I don't know. I'm not, I don't know if I'm aware of this. Yes, okay. The I didn't watch this trailer, but the trailer for Chapel Wait um Hmm. came out uh it premieres august 22nd on epics but it is a tv show uh inspired by the stephen king short story uh jerusalem's lot uh, which is a prequel of sorts to salem's lot yeah so yeah uh Maybe well, I mean, we'll have to put it on the docket. Apparently. Interessante. Yes, so uh, that should be fun. That premieres August twenty second. Don't know anything about it, but hmm. but yeah, but uh, Stephen King did tweet a couple of things. Okay. Um, really, one. This is just promo for the episode "No Light, No Spark," which I'll I'll actually save this tweet for when we when we go into that review. So I have one tweet to share. It's Stephen King news as of eight fifteen p.m. July 8th, 2021, he uh, tweeted, I had a tooth extraction today. Very painful. I'm treating it with season six of Line of Duty. So, yeah, whatever. (laughs) Okay. Um, I was going to, I was going to try to troll you and be like, "Um," (laughs) and lie (laughs) and say, I'm treating it with uh, binge listening to Tower Junkies. (laughs) Oh, God. Do you uh, like, yeah, that, can you imagine? (laughs) I can't. No, I I can't either. (laughs) Uh, Get well soon, Steve. (laughs) Um, yeah, so tooth extraction, yeah. Hmm, How do you feel about Stephen King's teeth? Uh, Hopefully they're fine. Yeah, I I hope so too. He can continue eating. Yeah, (laughs) right. All right, well, that's Stephen King check-ins and news. (laughs) Exciting. (laughs) Um, okay, so let's go in. Do you want to go into our reviews of Lisey's story, episodes seven and eight? All right, so uh, plot summary for Lisey's story, of course, is based on the novel by Stephen King. This terrifying thriller follows widow Lisey Landon as a series of disturbing events revives memories of her mar- of her marriage to author Scott Landon and the darkness that plagued him. So we're going to be reviewing episodes seven and eight. These are the final two episodes of the series, and they aired on July 9th and July 16th. Um, yeah, so first up, we're going to be reviewing episode seven, No Light, No Spark. We're going to do a non-spoiler review, and then we'll play some music and then play, uh, then do the spoiler review. But just to give you a rundown, this, uh, this episode aired, of course, July 9th, teleplay by Stephen King, directed by Pablo Lorraine, and it stars Julianne Moore, Joan Allen, Jennifer Jason Lee, Dane DeHaan, Soon Kang. Um, so Tiny. This episode mm-hmm. is, uh, oh, oh, I was just going to say, uh, Stephen King's tweet promoting it. <laughs> um, he tweeted, uh, so people behind the curtain, we're recording this July 8th, so because we have the screener. So he tweeted this this afternoon. He said, tomorrow's episode of Lisey's story, No Light, No Spark, is one that means a great deal to me. I hope you enjoy. So thank you, Steve. I did enjoy it. <laughs> um, so tiny and broad overall terms, non-spoiler. How did you feel about No Light, No Spark? Uh, this was a decent episode. Um, it wasn't, I don't know if it's going to be one of my favorites or anything, uh, but it's definitely not one of the worst. Um, I, I I thought it was a little slow here and there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it was, uh, it, it was a good episode though, because I think it's um, just... I think it kind of did a better job of showcasing, for lack of a better word, mm-hmm. uh, showcasing Scott's death. Yeah, and uh, than than the book did, in my mm-hmm. opinion. Um, yeah, I just, it, oh, it yeah. felt it felt more detailed and more involved. Um, mm-hmm. I feel like it was a little out of the blue or out of place. I guess, like obviously, we've known this whole time that he's dead, right? And it's not it's not it's not a spoiler. He he dies, mm-hmm. um, but it just. It felt a little shoehorned in, like uh, just they spent so much time with it, mm-hmm. and it seemed a little um, out of place in this point in the story. I guess mm-hmm. um, I don't, I don't have a, an issue with it really, it's, I, or a big issue, but I think I just noticed it. I was like, oh, we're kind of spending this is like almost half this episode with with his death process, yeah, um, and. I don't know. I, I feel like it wasn't that big of an event in the book. 
right compared to this i I don't know hmm. i didn't have a problem with it i thought it was all fine um i enjoyed um i i've kind of felt like i wanted more clive owen mm-hmm. more scott landon throughout this whole series um i understand you know obviously that he can't be there as much because he's gone right but um I, I don't I don't mean that as a criticism. I mean that as a, I'm enjoying him. Mm-hmm. I'm enjoying Clive Owen in this role, and I'm enjoying the character. So okay. I, I want to get a lot more of him. But I, I understand that you know he is he has a limited role, um, and so it was nice to spend so much time with Clive Owen. Yeah, uh, I, I enjoyed that part of the episode for sure. Um, and that okay. was the the meat of the episode. And then uh, the back half was kind of the whole. <laughs> it was almost like uh, Kevin McAllister getting ready for the bad guys <laughs> to show up. Yeah. You know, it was kind of fun. Um, um, yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, it was a uh, it was a fun episode though. Yeah, I I agree. Um, I actually liked this episode a lot. Um, I don't know if I would say it's the standout episode for me. It might actually be. Hmm. Um, but I did I did really like the Good Brother, honestly. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting you bring up the kind of extended death sequence and everything because it is different from from the book. Okay. Um, what I remember from the book, and and I think that kind of purposefully he conceals it in the book uh, because we're we're on Lisey's journey through her grief. And I mean, the experience of of his death was that you know he died out of town, like he like it, it was sudden and quick and and she i don't know if she even got to the hospital i maybe she, yeah she did because the whole um you were there and brought me ice mm. um i think or that might have been the gunshot i don't know anyway one of the things that i have been kind of struggling with in in this show uh in the way it's been written and it's something that i haven't really vocalized on these reviews but i have been vocal about it on patreon mm-hmm. um is the, how kind of, and I, I think I have brought it up on the show, but um, how up until now, it's like they haven't said anything about how he died. Yeah. And uh, my fear and my concern and my f- frustration was that it was like misleading because we don't get a lot of the gun, of the gunshot, uh, the attempt, the writing. Right. Yeah. And so, like, it kind of feels like, okay, are they trying to imply that he died from that? Or, mm. like, audiences are going to think that he died from that and not from something else. Right. And so, up until I started Episode 7, up until I started No Light, No Spark, I thought, like, okay, this is, uh, looking at the, I mean, looking at the thumbnail, this is going to be showcasing how Scott died. And I was like, okay, finally, finally we can get that. And then, like, <laughs> the more cynical part of mine is, like, and we're just going to delay the Jim Dooley show down even more. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, when we get those first 20 minutes and we see Scott, you know, coughing, uh, what, I've, what I have dubbed uh, rock star author Scott Landon. <laughs> <laughs> um, because it is, I mean, it is, like... I don't, I don't, I assume, I'm sure Stephen King probably gets that kind of reception if he does like a speaking engagement like that. Yeah. But also, does he? <laughs> right. Like that, like level of, of, uh, like rock star fame. Like red carpet behind a velvet yeah. rope, fans behind velvet ropes type yeah. thing. Yeah. That's a little, yeah, I agree. Yeah. And another thing that I thought was funny that I brought up on Patreon is that, um, <laughs> when they introduce Scott on the stage and they're like, he's been a best-selling author for decades and, and whatever. And, uh, and then they say, um, he's, <laughs> he's written 10 best-selling books. <laughs> um, all I thought was like, I just imagined Stephen King writing that line and being like, he's, 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 um, he's, he's published 10 best-selling books. And then Stephen King stopping and being like, that's cute. Um, <laughs> Pussy. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, but I won't go into spoilers about what happens during this extended like opening sequence and everything. We'll talk about that in spoilers. But I thought like as soon as I like as soon as it play it was playing out and everything, I was like, okay, this is why they've held back on what this is and and like what's happened to him in the present because. Now we have so much detail. We have so much information about Booyah Moon and everything, and Lisi struggled to get to Booyah Moon and everything. So now that kind of ups the stakes of Scott, you know, suffering um, in this environment. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I thought that was fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then the back half of the episode was more conventional, actiony, thriller kind of thing. Um, how do you yeah. feel about how that all kind of? 
came about and non-spoilers, and then we can go into spoilers. Um, I, I was happy with it. I, again, I thought it was, um, it was nice to have a non catatonic Amanda mm-hmm. because, uh, she, she's entertaining. Yes. And her, she, she's added some comic relief. Um, and that continued in this part. I just think, you know, she, um, <laughs> like she just, uh, I don't, it's not really a spoiler, but I don't want to bring it up. But just, just her presence has yeah. been been refreshing these last couple episodes. Yeah, the um, hockey stick, the thing. hockey stick. That's what I was gonna say. The hockey yeah. stick was so funny. Yeah, and the um, S and M thing. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, she's just been she's added a whole new dynamic, being a more um, present, a more present character. I um, totally agree. I've appreciated that. So, yeah. uh, and and again, her bouncing off of Darla because mm-hmm. she's so. Um, confrontational and, yes. and uh uh antagonistic mm-hmm. um it's just been another dimension of of the, of her attitude and uh the relationship she has with both her sisters not just Lisey. yeah um so yeah that's that that's been it that was just entertaining and i i enjoyed that um and again it was nice. just it just made me think of kevin McAllister getting ready for <laughs> uh you know the wet bandits and, to come yeah, over and i don't really mean that is. in a critical way right I, it, it's funny genuinely entertaining sure and funny to me um yeah it, it made me think of that even though there's really not a lot of like you know like setting up micro machines on the stairway or right. anything like that or mm-hmm. whatever yeah um cool well should we go into spoilers sure yeah okay well we're gonna go into spoilers for Lisey story episode seven no light no spark i'm gonna play some music here and then uh we'll come back and do spoilers no light no spark is the name of episode 7 of Lisey's Story. And this is our review on the spoilers of No Light, No Spark for episode 7. And I'm trying not to be jealous that Pizza is laying in front of Tiny and not near me because she's my pretty kitty and Tiny <laughs> is just a guest. <laughs> Lisey's Story. <laughs> this is like the fourth or fifth recording in a row where she's come up here. Yeah, and I think it's because I have the mixer in front of me and the laptop in front of the mixer, okay. and then you're just there. Gotcha. Um, yeah, also the laptop is warm. Mm. Um, I think it's me, but whatever. Well, I don't know. I, she knows you're allergic, so she's trying to kill you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Pizza. Uh, she's such a good kitty. Um, okay, so spoilers on for No Light, No Spark. Let's talk in more detail about... Uh, Scott's death, the first 20 minutes of this episode. Mm -hmm. Um, actually before that, let's talk about the cult of Landon guy who came in and was like, I made you a wand. Right. Um, how'd you feel about that encounter? Um, it was creepy. I'm not sure what the point of it was. Yeah. I, I kind of feel like it was maybe intended to just set up, um, uh, kind of further show how, uh, deranged his, some of his fans are. Yeah. And also, uh, maybe just fake out scare kind of thing. Gotcha. Like, oh, this is where it's going to happen. This is, he's, he's coughing, but this is where he's going to get killed or something. And mm-hmm. then it's just like, oh, I made a wand. Well, and also I think it sort of, uh, it was, it was a way to set up a line that's in the, later on in the episode. Ah, uh, where yes. she's um, she's kind of where Lisi uh Dooley has broken in and he turned the lights off and he's like mm-hmm. cre- inching towards her, and she's kind of making fun of him, like comparing yes. him to this other guy, mm-hmm. um, like another crazed fan. Yeah, deep space um, cowboys. Another deep space cowboy. Yeah. yeah, I think she. Yeah, she refers to Cole specifically. Yeah, um, who Cole was the gunman, right? So he wasn't the guy with the wand, right? But I th- I think it was showing that scene with the guy who made the wand was another just kind of a refresher on the, oh, yeah. on the craziness of the deep space cowboys and yeah um and yeah. that's something that I, I kind of notice is that they all kind of look very similar they do <laughs> um, they look like school shooters yeah oh yeah a mass shooters um yeah. like white bloated face guys yes um and also and and I I I don't know if this is just me reaching or whatever but Compared to how Michael Pitt looks in the flashbacks, mm-hmm. kind of similar there too. Maybe I'm reaching. Mm. Maybe yeah, I don't know if yeah. that was intentional. Maybe I'm reaching. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but uh, but yeah. So that was that was interesting and everything. But as it goes in, uh, the scene where he is in the bathroom 
and he's mm-hmm. you know like dying the wounds are resurfacing and everything yeah that whole sequence on one hand uh creeped me out okay. um was effectively like like frightening to me and just that i think it plays into that whole that feel that i have of of like emotional or or like authentic horror, like yeah. the thought of like, oh, your your body is in decline right now. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, that is that's frightening to me. But also, did you get major sh- vibes of the shining? Yes. Totes. Yes. Right off the bat. Oh yeah. Yep. Oh yeah. And it's not even like they're not even really that similar. No. Uh the two bathrooms, the style of them are mm-hmm. completely different, but I think of the camera angle. Yeah. Was it look at the kind of a wide angle shot that's slowly mm-hmm. closing in had total shining vibes totally yeah. totally yeah. and i assume that was intentional it uh, almost has to be yeah, yeah. Almost, it almost has to be yeah. yeah so that was cool right um but his actual death doesn't occur <laughs> there right uh he makes it to booyah moon and then he comes back and he does his uh he's on stage and <laughs> on patreon i was like uh, uh what did I, I said something super self-deprecating but um <laughs> uh oh like i like just imagine how horrifying it is to just die on stage and then and then i said like oh if you're listening to this and you ever went to shocktober in irvington you know exactly how that felt for me <laughs> um <laughs> nice i really i was proud of what we did yeah anyway, totally um yeah yeah um so is it ever really revealed what actually killed him not exactly what i gathered from and i was going to ask if this is what you took from it as well but Um, and maybe this is also a pacing issue and a chronology issue as well, because I think what the implication of it is, and maybe it's expressly stated and I just didn't pay attention to it, but I think what it is, is that when he was a kid, when he and Paul were kids and Paul had the bad that ended up getting killed. That's right. He scratched him. He scratched him. Okay. And then, uh, and then their dad is like, oh, you're, 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 um, you're doomed now or something like that. Mm-hmm. There's no way out of this or whatever. That's right. And so like my interpretation is that, okay, that mark that was left on him by his demonic brother, he like made the rest of his life living on borrowed time. Okay. That's my, that's what, and but it seems kind of arbitrary that like, why would it now take effect? And, and be so sudden. Yeah. Yeah. Although I guess in the hospital room, he did say that when he, I think that this is what it was because it was all kind of cloudy and, and weird. But he said that he kept trying to go back to Booyah Moon, but the lawn boy kept blocking his path, I guess, to the pool. Interesting. Yeah, that's what I thought that he said. Okay. Um, yeah. What did you think of that hospital scene, by the way? I, I, I thought that just the her walking the halls with the doctor and the dialogue and everything was like, that was like emotionally like tense for me. Yeah, so definitely. Yeah. And mm-hmm. uh, again, the visual of it. Yes. Like a really, it was a really cool set. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I liked that about it for sure. Um, I refer to it as the millionaire ICU. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice. Um, but yeah, it was. Um, again, it was all. It was. I feel like the whole process was drawn out, but then mm-hmm. him dying was just so fast. Yeah, really quick and everything. And I was a little confused as to like what was actually killing him. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought it was just maybe like the the healing powers of Booyah Moon were finally just wearing out, and oh, all yeah. all of, all of this physical trauma that he had been inflicted to and inflicted um, against his whole life was just catching up. Like the the healing waters weren't taking care of those things anymore and they were just resurfacing or something like that. But I think, I think you, you're right though. It's something to do with that scratch. Um, Yeah. The bad finally just kept up or caught up with him or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, But, uh, but yeah, it was, it was kind of nuts. Yeah, just the, how quick it all happened and everything. Yeah, the the st- going back to him on stage and everything when he threw up the water. Yeah, that was that was some intense imagery. Right. Um. Definitely. Really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But yeah, the the hospital scene was was actually heartbreaking. Like it. Um. Mm-hmm. It it just it uh like my heart broke a little bit for it. Right. Uh, for her. Um. And then did. Then they did kind of a time lapse. Like, this felt a little bit cliche, but, like, the funeral scene and the wake scene and everything, it's just, Mm -hmm. like, that classic, like, okay, the grieving widow's wandering through, but everything is silent. Like, we can't hear anything to symbolize that she's not paying attention and that everything (laughs) is on autopilot and everything. Right. I was like, okay, this, this, I've seen this in, like, millions of things. Definitely. Um, I was, I was a little checked out. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 
It didn't really seem necessary. No, no, it really didn't. Yeah. Um, especially when kind of the entire, the, a big part of the entire show and the entire story is her grief. Like we don't need to right. see the immediate grief of the funeral and everything. Cause we've been living in her grief for the last six episodes. Yeah. So yeah, uh, that just seemed a little just unnecessary. I agree. Um, I agree. Yeah. <clears throat> so Jim Dooley and Lisi and the sisters. Mm-hmm. Um, first of all, maybe my like favorite, maybe my favorite scene of the episode, which is saying something because the, I mean, the visuals in, in this episode and this entire series has been incredible. Um, but that overhead shot of Jim Dooley walking, um, that was, yes, that was definitely this episode, obviously. <laughs> um, walking and then like the way that it, cause he's approaching it. He's approaching the house mm-hmm. and we know that Beckman, the cop is there cause he came back and then he's walking across this muddy field and the way that the camera moves, like we don't, like we don't have a, um, perspective on where he is in the field. Mm-hmm. But then the cop car just appears as it's guiding, as, as yeah. he's going and then it just cold. Yes. Him. How'd you feel about that? That was so cool. I, yeah. I agree. I mean, I just think of the technic, like the um, technical aspect of filming that scene. Mm-hmm. Just having you know a big boom uh, camera yeah. on a big boom, just following him, and mm-hmm. um, yeah, I, all the rain and everything. Yes, was so cool. And I, I wish I would have rewound it or something. But mm. did he time his gunshot to go off with a thunderclap? I don't, I don't think so. But I don't think so either. I, I, because I, I, I immediately thought like, I wonder if they heard that. But then I was like, well, it's storming, so they probably right, you know, whatever. That's what um, I, was thinking. I it would have been. He a, was, yeah, kind of a fun little Shawshank Redemption reference. Yeah, you know, I thought, yeah. I thought that's what maybe they were going for. Because again, why, why didn't they hear the gunshot? But right. It's yeah. not important, really. But yeah, I don't know if he. I don't know if he's as cal- well. I don't know if I want to say he's not that calculating, but I think he's more um, just seat of his pants, right? Kind of, yeah. Performance or action. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that that was that was cool. Mm-hmm. Definitely a cool scene. Yeah. Do you remember from the book if he had the night vision goggles? I don't remember that part. If, okay. And, I, 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 if it was, I don't remember it. I'll put it that way. Okay. And do you remember if he killed any cops in the in the book? Again, I don't. I think feel like that would have jumped out to yeah. me. Yeah. And I don't think he did. I I I don't know if he did or not. I don't think he did. But anyway, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the night vision goggles gave me such. I I've, I'm fairly sure that that was in that that's in the book. But it okay. just it really gave me just obviously. Uh, super intense silence of the lambs oh yeah feels um definitely just really cool mm-hmm. um and just the confrontation that was that was amazing it was it was amazing the brutality of it yes again the the the, the physical uh violence in the show is very it's pretty sparing really mm-hmm. like there's not really not a lot of it yeah um it, it feels like there's a lot of it because like you know Scott as a kid having the bad let right. out and he cuts himself the the blood bull mm-hmm. and uh, it, it I guess on paper there's a lot of violence but yeah. there really isn't I mean mm-hmm. it seems so few and far between in the in the actual show mm-hmm. I mean an eight hour no not even a seven hour mm-hmm. uh, show we we get like you know maybe 25, 30 minutes of, like, violence, blood violence, when it seems like there should be two hours, you know? Yeah. Um, But those those violent moments are so pivotal. And so intense, and they just really jump out. Yeah. Yeah. And and again, uh, we'll talk about this uh, later in this episode, but the sound Mm -hmm. is just intense. And what I loved about their struggle, like their their big scuffle in uh, with Jim Dooley's, first of all, I love that... Um, that Lisi taps the book and it like the the uh, lighthouse light comes on and that's what you know starts them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that that was cool. But I really, <laughs> I'm kind of back and forth on this. I really res- respect and enjoyed the clumsiness of the of the fighting. Um, because on paper, yes. yeah, on paper, okay, three three women with weapons taking on one man. Like you would in the think dark. in the dark, 
you would think like, okay, that's, you know, action choreography, you'll, you'll do it. But like, they are so clumsy and Mm -hmm. everything is so like, um, improvised it seems right it just it felt it made it feel so much more authentic yeah the plan almost falls apart yeah because they are pretty unsuccessful right at attacking him yeah but the other thing i i really like that the authenticity of that how it felt authentic and and uh intense but the dialogue didn't really work for me. <laughs> yeah, I don't really remember what there, was said, but... There's, like, two or three lines where I think, like, Darla's like, oh, kill him, kill him, kill him, or something. Yeah. It's just, like, very faux adrenaline, I think. Yeah, and she says, does she say something like, you fucker, like, something like die. that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. She was a little... Well, it, it seems... Tower Junkies is the best Steven King podcast. <laughs> um, it seems on point for her character though that's true because she's so confrontational and over the top and yeah annoying that she would say something that stupid and ridiculous right but that's fair yeah yep um so how did you feel about the conclusion of all this the 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 trip to booyah moon and the way that the episode ends um i i was on board i i was expecting jim dooley to be a little more uh discombobulated Mm -hmm. and um Conf- yeah confused by confused, what, what happened yeah <laughs> uh, and he seemed to roll with it decently mm-hmm. well um but i did like What'd the action me missus yeah right <laughs> um like the actual closing part where mm-hmm. she's like summoning the long boy yeah that was pretty cool I that mean, yeah that was really cool and it made me think like the whole time i was like they're in booyah moon like is this are they going to conclude this storyline here? And right. Then is like the whole last episode going to be something different? Um, cause I'm like thinking like, Oh, there's like four minutes left and <laughs> there's right. a lot of stuff go- to happen. Yeah. Um, but I-, I thought that as a cliffhanger, that was interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, cause it ends with her being like, there you are or whatever. And the yeah. lawn boy's like, yep, uh, here I am. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's not, that's not the lawn boy's voice. Right. Um, <laughs> they don't have a voice. Um, but the design of the lawn boy, um, it's really disturbing. Really, really disturbing. Yeah. Uh, there's more close-ups and everything in the second and the, the final episode. Right. Again, the sound. Yeah. Yes. The sound is arguably the most effective part of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts on No Light, No Spark? No, I think we covered it pretty well. Yeah, me too. Um, I Oh, yeah. The other thing that I didn't really like uh, about the fight and everything was that um, while he's choking her out... Um, like at the kind of climax of it and everything, he's choking her, and then he's like, "Respect, no oh. wife, respect." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, okay, come right. on. I I wasn't super happy with um, Dane DeHaan in the last two episodes. Yeah, they're just if they didn't really give him a lot to work with. They they really didn't. It's a bummer. But. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So I think that that'll do it for our review of No Light No Spark. The other thing I wanted to mention is that. The when at the beginning of the episode when she's walking through the hospital and then the door closes as she's going into the oxygen like room the hospital room and everything mm-hmm. the hallway it just says like oxygen in use no light no spark I was like I forgot <laughs> like I, I I'm sure that that is like in the book yeah but I've forgotten the context and everything gotcha um, so I thought that was really cool yeah yep all right well we are gonna go ahead and uh, go into our review of the final episode of Lisey's story titled. Lisey Story, the eponymous episode of Lisey Story, titled mm-hmm. Lisey Story. Yep. Um, it aired on July 16th, uh, teleplay, of course, by Stephen King, directed by Pablo Lorraine, and for the final time, the cast, Julianne Moore, Joan Allen, Jennifer Jason Lee, Dane DeHaan, Michael Pitt, Sun Kang. Um, yeah, so... This is the this was the final episode of Lisey's Story. We're going to do a broad non-spoiler review and then we'll do a spoiler review. Uh check the show notes and everything. Um so tiny. Um yep. Before we get into our broad terms and everything, when you pressed play on the on the final episode, mm-hmm. where were you at mentally with the show? Like where did you like how did you feel about uh, feel about it and feel about finishing the series? Um I I mean I was excited to Mm-hmm. to get to the end you know i um i i was glad that i was liking it as much as i was and as much as i do now that it's over mm-hmm. um because i wasn't big on the book and i i think i think the book was good but it just wasn't my thing and it wasn't for me and i didn't right. didn't connect with it 
Um, and so I, it was important to me that the show was good and that I liked the show. Mm. Um, and that I think that, you know, I wanted the show to be a good representation of the story. Mm. And I think it was, and it, you know, I, I was feeling that it was going to be going into this last episode. Yeah. Um, and having concluded it, I think, I think it was a good show and it was a good representation of the story. And it gave me a lot more enthusiasm for Lisey's story as a story. Nice. Yeah. Nice. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, this, I mean, this is probably something to say for the end of it and everything, but, um, well, I'll, I'll ask this at the end. If I remember, I'll prob probably forget and then cringe when I listen back to this. But anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, for me, uh, broad terms, I, I mean, I went into it. I was pretty excited. Um, excited to finally finish it. And, um, <laughs> uh, and I was also pretty, pretty excited because I knew, how the story was going to unfold. I knew what was going to happen. And I knew that honestly, the end of the book is my favorite part of the book for specifically the, the, um, the relationship between Lisi and Scott mm -hmm. and how that resolves itself with her own bull hunt and her own story that she finds. Um, the way that that plays out in the book, it was very satisfying. So I was excited to kind of experience that knowing that King was writing, writing this teleplay himself. Um, so yeah, so in broad terms, how'd you feel about Lisey's story, episode eight, Lisey's story? I think it was a great conclusion. Um, you know, the, the kind of climax happens in the first 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah. And so there's a lot left after that, um, which is true, true for the book too. Sure. Um, yeah. but I think that was a great decision. I'm glad, I'm glad that they stuck with that for the show. Um, cause I think what's covered in the, the denouement is, is so integral to the characters and mm -hmm. is one of the most important parts of the story. Um, and I, it's something I didn't connect with as much when I read the book because I was by this point, I just kind of wanted to get the book over with. Right. And so I really didn't, the, the, the last 20% of the book really didn't hold my attention well at all. And I didn't retain hardly anything from it, um, which is a real shame. Hmm. Um, and so I was looking forward to this episode because I wanted it to fill those gaps yeah. and, uh, and, and be, again, be a good representation of, of the end of the book. And so, um, I, I'm really glad they took their time with, mm -hmm. with the denouement and like, it, it was true to the book. Um, cause I wanted the, I wanted the story to conclude that way. I think it was yeah. the, the proper way to do it. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it was, again, it was a clear, a clearer representation of it. And I got a lot more out of the, uh, the show than I did the book. So, um, I definitely liked yeah. it. Yeah. Nice. I, you know, it's interesting because like I said, I was, I was very much into the, into the ending of the book. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 it's interesting because I think I came away from it same as you after having going into it with actually higher expectations okay. <laughs> um, uh, because it was my, probably my favorite part of the book itself. And um, I think it, I think they pulled it off incredibly well. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that there were some, some in the grand scheme of things, some strange pacing and chronology decisions. Um, like the entire decision to make like the climax of the action portion of the story and everything be contained in the first nine minutes of the episode felt just weird when mm -hmm. the previous episode left on that pseudo cliffhanger of, you know, the lawn boy arriving. Right. And it just, it kind of felt like, okay, after having an episode where almost half of the runtime of the episode is devoted to Scott Landon, Scott Landon. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> his death. And then the second half of the episode being the Jim Dooley conflict and everything to immediately go to an episode where in the grand scheme of things, a fraction of the episode is the conclusion of the Jim Dooley action stuff. And then sort of, sort of conspiracy, um, hiding bodies kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then Lisey's story and the conclusion of Scott Landon's backstory. Yeah. It just felt like, it felt like, uh, it felt like there wasn't, it was confusing and not confusing, but it was a little, it was a little, um, hard to focus my attention on it because those different sections of the story were so wildly disproportionate from each other mm -hmm. in terms of runtime. Right. Um, so it just kind of felt a little, just 
clumsy but still passable and uh, satisfying in terms of performance and writing, though, of like dialogue and communicating the ideas of the marriage. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so um, <clears throat> the one dangling thread that I don't think uh, no, I'll save that for spoilers, but um, the ugh, I, I I don't know how to dance around spoilers. Um, should we just go into spoilers? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go into spoilers. Guys, we're going to go into spoilers. Um, <laughs> because I can't really say anything about this, uh, without spoiling it. And I want to make sure you guys have a chance. So, uh, we're going to play a little bit of music and then, sp- and then we'll come back and do spoilers for Lisey's story, episode eight, Lisey's story. For the last time, I'm going to try to sing along to the theme music of Lisey's Story, because I've already done the Patreon reviews, and then this is the last episode that we're going to be doing to cover Lisey's Story, the TV show, based on the book by Stephen King, and its teleplay is by Stephen King, and it's directed by Pablo Lorraine, and it's on Apple TV+. Plus. Lisey's Story. I'm so glad I don't have to do that ever again. Thank God that's over. Yes. Oh, jeez. Our long I, national nightmare. Yes. I like it, it. It's been just as hard on me doing this thing that I'm doing by choice. Um, no, it hasn't. <laughs> it it has been actually <laughs> um, because it's so much easier to do that for Marvel on Patreon. Anyway, <laughs> spoilers on for Lisey's story. Um, so the uh the the death of Jim Dooley. Mm-hmm. That for as brief as it was, and as as you noted in the in the review of the previous episode, Dane DeHaan isn't, despite having like b- big moments in the show mm-hmm. in these last two episodes, doesn't have a lot to work with in terms of performance wise and writing. Mm-hmm. But uh, his death scene was just the close ups of the lawn boy. Yeah, just f- like messed me up. It was it right. was pretty intense. Yeah. Um, and also when he is disoriented and he says, uh, he, like, this is slightly, like, slightly goofy and everything, but, uh, he says, I'm the son of Scott Landon. I'm the prophet. Yeah. I am the lighthouse. Beam me up, Scotty. Right. Um, and then he dies. That was a little goofy. Yeah. 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 Uh, how'd you feel about that whole sequence? Yeah, I wasn't super on board with it. And just, just the the dynamic of their kind of battle, their confrontation between Lisey and Jim Dooley, it seems like it just, yeah, it feels like he just kind of gives up and just starts talking to the lawn boy and says those weird things yeah, and just gets taken. Like, I don't understand. Mm-hmm. I, I When I was listening to the book, it seemed like it was more of like she was kind of leading him towards the lawn boy yeah. like using him as bait and then mm. the lawn boy comes out and grabs him and takes the bait mm-hmm. um you know she's sort of stringing him along whereas it's right. like the lawn boy just kind of shows up to their fight yeah and then they stop fighting and it's like his it's like jim dooley's attention is focused on the lawn boy now right finally and, <laughs> yeah and he just kind of like i guess he doesn't see it as a threat or mm-hmm. i don't know i don't know what his right motivations were for doing that and saying those things mm-hmm. and basically just letting himself be taken by yeah. the lawn boy i i don't get that and uh, yeah. i wasn't crazy about it yeah i don't know um i think that it may have been uh, my, uh, I don't know, off the cuff thought is that it could have been just a, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, uh, just the, 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 uh, apex of his cult of Landon personality. Like yeah. he maybe saw it or understood it to be this world that maybe in his understanding that he felt like he was, he was owed, like he believed he was a prophet for scott landon and then maybe he realized that he was in a world of like what he perceived as being a world of scott landon's imagination or something right but also if that's the case i don't think it was communicated clearly enough exactly yeah i had the same thought i was like Mm. maybe he thinks this is some form of redemption for him or some ultimate achievement Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Because he's in a world that Skylander created or something like that. Right. Yeah, I, I had the same thought, but yeah. again, that's all. Achievement spe- unlocked. <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> all. Lawn boy. That's all speculation, so. Yeah. Yeah. And I also don't really get why back in on Earth, or back the real <laughs> world, whatever you want to call it, his his disfigured body showed yes. up in the pool. Like, was he a double? And some people aren't doubles. Oh. Don't have two representations, like one in Booyah Moon and one in Earth. That I the honestly I I didn't think that hard about it, but I okay. you might that might actually be one hundred percent right. I mean that okay. I think that that might be actually what it is because my memory of the book is that he is taken by the lawn boy and she never I don't maybe I'm misremembering it, but she never really sees him die Mm -hmm. and so i think she has this lingering thought that like okay well i mean the lawn boy could bring him back at any time yeah um or maybe she thought that the lawn boy would come after her i don't know but um but that kind of threw me for a loop because um i i kind of thought like okay so because this is now we're nine minutes into this 50 some minute episode (laughs) so is the rest i know that a, a big portion of the episode is going to be you know, Lisey's story that he's re- that she's reading his story and his backstory about his father and everything. Mm-hmm. But are we also going to do this um, this uh, cover up storyline? Because she has to dispose of the body. She notices the cop's body, and then she has to call the police. And I'm sitting there thinking, like, is this going to be some like Breaking Bad esque like cover up thing where she gets deeper and deeper into it? And then I'm glad I didn't go that route, but. Also, I kind of feel like, I kind of feel like I, I don't, I don't know what that accomplished in her greater story. Like her being able to kind of without, without any real conflict or anything or any, any obstacles able to just dispose of this dude's dismembered corpse. Right. Um, I, maybe the coldness of that is supposed to be that she's a different person now or that she's. Yeah kind of similar to Jim Dooley in that respect, but yeah. that's not a good it's not a good look. <laughs> no, no, it didn't really work. Yeah. I, I didn't I didn't really get I mean, there's some cool visuals like his yeah. his body being all just was fucked up. And right. Again the way she just coldly threw it in the river. Yeah. First of all that set was cool. Oh yeah. Um I the establishing shot of that was really cool. Yeah. Um because definitely. it's it was like an inverted shot of the river and then the yes. camera like moved like tilted up and then swung right. swung around. It was really cool. Definitely cool. Uh, yeah. So I liked all that, but it, I just didn't understand the reasons for it and yeah. the logic behind it or whatever. I I didn't really get it. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I just thought it was kind of strange. Yeah. How did you feel about the resolution of the dead cop stuff? Um, so I liked the kind of. Um, repartee between mm-hmm. the chief of police or whoever and yeah. and Lisi where he's like is there something you're not telling me and right. she's like yeah <laughs> that I, I and she he was like all right well enjoy your pie like i genuinely <laughs> liked that me dialogue too. and that sequence of events um mm-hmm. but uh i thought it, the i feel like it was a little too easy how she just kind of yeah th- there's no investi or like she she was coming out of the courthouse after a grand jury right investigation and it's just like i it wasn't explored enough i guess and because right. that wasn't in the was any of that in the book i don't i i don't know honestly i don't know because okay. i don't remember if any of the police were killed <laughs> okay i don't remember but either in that scene where he's where he's talking to her and everything and they're doing that kind of uh not like like that not questioning and not confirming kind of dance. Right. I like when I was watching that I was like I remember something like that from the book but I don't remember the specifics. I don't remember exactly what happened. Okay. Um so it's possible that that is lifted from the book and everything but I I agree. I think it was just really it it kind of felt like we had like a big moment for the overall story and everything and then like what the next kind of um, natural progression of that storyline and that conflict and that drama is just kind of just breezed by. <laughs> right. Um, so I don't know that, that kind of, that didn't really sit that well with me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there was something else about all of that that I can't uh, place. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> let me check my notes. Cause I thought that there was something after that. 
Oh, oh, that's what it was. Yeah. Um, something I didn't even realize until tonight. Um, after I, after I watched it last night is that we get one shot of dash meal seeing the news of the dead cop and yeah. Dually being on the run or being, you know, at large. Yeah. And that's it. Like, I don't understand what the point of that was. Right. Um, I don't know. Yeah. It was a little sloppy, the whole episode. And mm-hmm. and it's funny because they had, I feel like they had a lot of time. Like, yeah. I, I understand that the bulk of the denouement needs to go to Lisi finishing the story yeah. and, and us getting to see that. And that's that we haven't even talked about it yet, but that stuff was really right. good. Really, oh, yeah. really well done. I liked all that a lot. Um, but I feel like these other things, you know, could have been explored a little better and mm-hmm. could have been wrapped up with a better bow, if, yeah. if you will. Um, Honestly, I, uh, and this is maybe, I don't know if I'd say, say blasphemous, but um, there seems to be in that first, what, 15, 20 minutes of the episode, the conference, like uh, the lawn boy and Jim Dooley and uh, disposing the body and the grand jury aftermath thing, <laughs> like all of that, I feel like there's enough content there or there's enough story there that's unexplored in those 15, 20 minutes that that could have been an entire episode. Yes. Like that could have been episode eight. Agreed. And then episode nine would be, would have been Lisey's story. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know. know. Um, before we move on to the, mm-hmm. uh, talking about Lisey's story. Yes. Um, the the long boy is it ever really explained what that is and no i because i i mean it's a being who Mm. is composed of dead bodies or like zombie like people being tortured in a state of agony Mm. um and i don't understand really what the purpose is of long boy in (laughs) in booyah moon and like why Mm. why it attacks people why it doesn't like noise yeah i mean it's cool as shit and it looks really good and it's scary and it's effective in that regard but i just i wish it was fleshed out a little more (laughs) fleshed out yeah right damn that was (laughs) totally unintentional and i understand that scott landon who is our conduit for what goes on at booyah moon Mm -hmm is so many things are still a mystery to him. Yeah. And there can still, there can be some mysterious aspects to another world, but it's like, yeah. this is such a big deal. I kind of wanted a little more information on what that is. Yeah. And, and honestly, and this is going to, I I feel icky making this criticism because I don't like this type of criticism, but Scott, so much of Booyah Moon and the Lawn Boy and everything being something that Scott doesn't understand, kind of feel like that could be interpreted as a cop out or a complete mm-hmm. crutch in the storytelling, right? Um, because, like you said, he is our conduit for Booyah Moon. He's our conduit to this entire otherworldly substance and otherworldly thing. Yeah, and to kind of have the conduit of that not know anything about it. <laughs> yeah. Is I mean that makes sense in a in a fictional sense and in structure sense, but also it's kind of like okay, yeah, we have the guy who's the expert of this who's dead, mm-hmm. not know anything about it, and it's just kind of I don't know I well, feel and yeah. she and that's the thing like Lisi obviously understands something about right Lawn Boy and what he is and what he wants mm-hmm. because she uses him as his the ultimate part of her plan right to kill Jim Dooley yeah. and then there's that scene I don't remember if it's in the book or not where she hands the shovel over mm. to it at the end and I'm like why okay why does the long boy want the shovel right. why is she giving it to him I don't I... again it looks pretty good yeah. and it's it's oh, yeah. kind of cool and I had my attention but it's like why just I... what's the why I have some thoughts about that that I don't know if this is me reaching or me interpreting something that uh, there's not enough information about. Mm -hmm. But my line of thinking, my rationalization for the lawn boy and this shovel handing and everything is that the lawn boy in the fact, in the, in the fact that it's, it's uh, this massive monster that is like it's, it's structure, it's mass is composed of wailing tortured human beings from presumably from Booyah Moon mm-hmm. that he, that it is grabbing and and ingesting and putting into its its like body couple that with the knowledge that 
the quote unquote shrouded people in Booyah Moon are people who have died who don't want to move on or or are in limbo um to kind of put it in kind of a rudimentary term and everything. Yeah. But my line of thinking is that the lawn boy takes the souls or the 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 people of Bu- Booyah Moon, the shrouded people of Booyah Moon and those that don't that are resistant to moving on or don't want to move on or can't move on are victims of the lawn boy. Okay. That's my that's my rational rationalization and uh-huh. that's my kind of that's my connecting dots that I don't know of I, I don't know if are in the text or in okay. the in the in the show. So that's my that's my thought. That's some interesting speculation. Yeah. I like that theory. Oh, thank you. If that's if that is the case, yeah. that's cool. But uh, thank me and thank Steve. <laughs> Old Stevie. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was just curious if you had any more insight into that because I was a little lost on it and it didn't affect my enjoyment too mm-hmm. much of it, but I just I feel like we could have gotten some of those answers. Yeah. Yep. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. I also made the comparison, I think on Patreon or somewhere, um, in my dream, in my dreams probably, but, um, I don't think I meant, I don't think I asked this of you, but, uh, the shots of the lawn boy kind of shrouded in the trees and everything and, and the imposing force and everything. Did you, did we talk about this? Did you get lost vibes from that? <laughs> no, I didn't, but okay. I, I, I am now that you say it. I, yeah. see, I see the parallel here. Yeah. In particular, like the pilot episode. Sure. Yeah. Anyway, just a slight observation. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. So, Lisey's story. Oh, mm-hmm. oh, the thought that I had about the stupid thought I had about the shovel and the, and the, um, and the lawn boy is that, uh, when that happened, I, <laughs> this is so dumb. Um, let's see. Where is it? Um, Oh god, we got to talk about the flashback and everything too. Um my stupid observation when she hands the uh shovel, which I I don't understand that either, by the way. Um my kind of theory on that is that maybe that that shovel is a totem of maybe not evil, but it's a totem of maybe not even like demonic demonic possession or like crazy crazy stuff or whatever. But I kind of feel like maybe the implication is that she no longer needs it um, because that was like a talismanic kind of thing or right. a representation of her, you know, fighting off evil or what have you in uh, her yeah, life. Yeah, I mean, cl- clearly it's a form of closure for her. I can, right. That's that's obvious, yeah. but I just don't but know. But why it. does the lawn boy want it? Why does the lawn boy want it? Yeah. <laughs> and why, does she, why is that her outlet for the closure is to give it to him or it? Right. I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I said uh, in my notes, I put, I don't really need the final scene with the lawn boy, but Jesus, the imagery is amazing. <laughs> Word. Um, but also I had, and this is so dumb. Um, <laughs> uh, sequel idea, Lisey story from the lawn boy's perspective. Uh, the lawn boy is on a bull, bull hunt and the prize is the shovel she gives it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't know. Stupid. Wow. Um, yeah. So let's talk about Lisey's story. Mm-hmm. Um, Scott writing out, Detailing what happened to him and his father um, following the death of Paul. Um, We get a very long flashback sequence with Paul uh, as a child caring for his father who is, you know, peak crazy grief, regret, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, dangerous person. Mm -hmm. Um, How'd you feel about this? How did you feel? A two-part question. How did you feel about that flashback and the resolution of the of of Paul's childhood storyline? And how did you feel about the way that it it was um, cross-cut with Scott writing it and Lisey responding to it while reading it? How did you feel about all of that? Yeah, I I was on board with all that. I think this that was some of the strongest part of the episode, mm-hmm. the strongest part of the series, actually. Yeah, um, I loved it. I, I I'm again, I've I've appreciated the way that. Pablo Lorraine and and as the director and Stephen King as the as the writer and then um, uh, Julianne Moore and Clive mm-hmm. Owen as the actors have balanced that. Whereas in the in the book you have like three timelines going at once. Yeah, you know, uh, the current time with Lisi and then her remembering a flashback and then the actual flashback itself. That's really difficult in the book, and yeah. they pulled it off great in the series. Mm-hmm. And this is another example of that. 
Um, I, I liked the narration of uh, Clive Owen as as Scott, and I loved the real quote unquote real time reactions of Lisi underneath yeah. the tree. Um, and then of course the flashbacks was just really great, uh, awesome, awesome acting, and again the visuals of their farm, which they said was in Pennsylvania. Yes. So I I, I kind of like <laughs> I was like oh fuck yeah okay right <laughs> we got was, our answer yeah totally yeah um, which I feel like that was in the book and I just missed it I'm sure it was yeah, yeah and I forgot it um, I forgot because as soon as you said Pennsylvania I was like yeah I feel like I remember yeah. that now but mm. um anyways that was all just great um and I I really appreciated it um great acting uh from the kid again um, yeah g- really good job um I especially like the scene where. The guy from the plant shows up, and because uh, yeah. it was like pretty much scene for scene, word for word from the book, which 100%. I I, I liked it a lot in the book too. Yeah, um, but there was some cool camera work there with uh, Andrew Landon coming up behind him with the gun and everything. And that I kind of I I wouldn't say I rolled my eyes at it, but I was like I that kind of took me out of it a little bit. Yeah, it was a little much. I just kind of liked the camera work. Yeah, it was a little unrealistic yeah. and silly, but. I, I think with me, I think it was because it was broad daylight and that kind of yeah. had this contrast in my brain. Like, and he's literally going through the woods. Like, it would have been so fucking loud. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he would have made some noise. Yeah. 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 Especially with all the, like, crunching leaves Ex- and the exactly. mud because it's constantly raining there. Right. Um, but I do agree that, like, I, I had kind of forgotten about that from the book. Like, I've forgotten everything from the book. Yeah, right. But, uh, like, as th- it's an interesting moment because I'm just sitting there like, oh, scene for scene from the book. And, like, this yeah. is interesting is it is it do you remember if it's explained in the book what he does with his dad's body um i don't remember i don't i i almost want to say that in the in the in the book he successfully takes him to booyah moon okay um couldn't remember but man that holy shit yeah the the there again we had another kind of uh trend or 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 we had another run of time with uh scott's dad where he is he's tender with him yeah like it's similar to that scene in like episode three or whatever but where he is he's like he's troubled he's disturbed he's he's very much unstable and and dangerous but he's also tender with his son and he is he's trying to like be you know nice i guess to him right but it's just it's it just makes it so um unnerving in a, in a weird way because you know that this child is not safe with this man yeah um, it's such a strange dynamic yeah yeah um the reason i asked is I, I i love that sequence where he ties him up to the tractor and drags him oh, out yeah. there and drops him down the well i mm-hmm. mean it's disturbing but there was something cool. so disturbingly sad about that yeah um that I thought was I, I like, I because it's not like explicitly stated like it's not it's not demonstrate it's kind of a matter of fact kind of presentation of it because right. it's like a static shot of him, uh, driving the tractor. But yeah. like there's something just so tragic and and heartbreaking about it. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, and I can't remember if it's explained in the book, but basically, Scott's state of mind like when he's killing his father. Mm-hmm. Because in the show, he's very stoic. Yeah. And like, you know, I, I, I was curious to see how he was going to be in that moment. Right. Oh, um, God, the but sound. He's, yeah. Fuck. But I, 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 I was pleased with what we got because, you know, I, I think there's a, any number of routes you could take that where mm-hmm. he was just bawling his eyes out or yeah. if he was really scared and hesitant. But he was just kind of confidently, mm-hmm. matter-of-factly driving a fucking... Yeah whatever the pickaxe into his dad's chest. Yeah. Um, I, I liked, I liked what they did and I think that that came across well. And then his, really his attitude after that, um, Mm -hmm. he was sort of treating it like a chore he had to do. Yes. Um, which it kind of was cause it was like, Mm. that was the obvious next step, I think. Right. Even to seven, eight, whatever, Mm. however you go, year old Scott was like, he's going to, I will die. Right. He's going to kill me or, 
something horrible is going to happen. Yeah, because because he even his father even says like at one point he's like one of us going to die. It's going to be one. It's going to be you or me, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then the kind of weird tragedy of it being the end of the bull hunt um, Mm -hmm. that his father set up for him and everything. Right. Um, All of that was just really like something really interesting about this episode is there's a considerable less amount of dialogue than in in other episodes. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it really works well um, because it is such a visual story in this, in this, in this final episode. Yeah. Um, Um, did you one thing I want I know I've noticed throughout, but I think it uh, was more prominent in this episode was uh, Andrew Landon throughout uh, is wearing dog tags. Oh yeah, and I I think in the book I don't know if it's explained in the show, but in the book I think Scott grew up like in the seventies. Yeah, roughly, so. and so yeah. I'm, I'm just I'm wondering if. His dad is a Vietnam veteran. I think so. I think in the book it's exp- ex- is it's it? expressly stated. Okay. Yeah. And maybe part of his psychosis, whatever you want to call it, his mental issues right. are related to his time in Vietnam. Yeah. And uh to go back to talking about Scott, child Scott having to dispose of his father's body. Now, like I, I can understand that as it correlates because there there's like parallels between his his childhood and Lisey's present with mm-hmm. you know the bodies and everything. Right. Uh, so I, I I like that as a parallel or as, um um way to kind of show them. I guess I don't know. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh. Though one thing that I I wanted to mention or something that I didn't really think about until watching this final episode, but um, I understand that they have to cut stuff and um, King is unable to put everything he has uh, into the miniseries and everything. But something I really wish I don't think I, something I don't think was touched on in the show that I really wish was, 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 ex, was, um, was to, I, I, something I really wish was incorporated into the show was the discussion of Lisey and Paul or Lisey and Scott uh, not having kids. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Because in the book, like he explains like, I, I can't have kids because, because what if they have the same thing? Right. Um, and they, I don't think there's any scene of that. Um, I don't think there was either. Yeah. And I kind of wish that that had been in it because that, that would make the, I, I kind of feel like the, the, uh, the, kind of finally scenes like scenes toward the very end uh that shows like scott telling her like oh you're uh, you're my love and everything and mm-hmm. you're my whole world and everything i think that that would have given it more import because they literally are only have each other right so i don't know I, yeah. that's just something i, I kind of thought of that's true i hadn't yeah. thought about that really yeah um what else what did you think of um you know the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the part where she is reading the last paragraphs mm. or paragraph or paragraphs of her story mm-hmm. um, were really touching, and they yes. So the that that those words and that those moments jumped out a lot more in the series than they did in the book. Yeah, I thought that was really touching, and uh, it was a nice end cap for their for their relationship mm-hmm. and then how well it worked. Uh, I feel like Julianne Moore and uh, Clive Owen had great chemistry yeah. throughout this whole, the whole series. And that was a, a nice uh, conclusion for that. Mm-hmm. And I just, I, I appreciated the dialogue again, the visuals and the, uh, uh, the kind of montage of, mm-hmm. of their happy times together. Yes. Which is really, I, I got a little choked up. Me too. Like I was, I wasn't about to cry or anything, but it was, mm-hmm. it was touching, yeah. which I was a little surprised that I didn't think I was going to react that way. Cause I, yeah. I didn't, I didn't feel a closeness to them mm-hmm. or to their relationship as I was reading the book. Yeah. Um, but it was much more prominent in, in the, sh- in the show. And mm-hmm. I was happy that, that it, that it was concluded so well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> he, uh, the whole, I mean, him, him leaving Bu- Buya Moon, him going into the pool and, and right. that goodbye scene, like as mm-hmm. fucking weird as it was to see him all shrouded in this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, just the dialogue there, the, the, the emotion of it was, was really, really mm-hmm. a, a good button on the show. Definitely. 
Um, the final thing, because I'm running out of steam, and I think we're running out of plot to yep. discuss, to discuss. I can tell you're like half asleep. I am t- I'm getting tired. Um, I'm fading. Yes, but uh, kind of the end end of the show has a flashback of the girls. Um, yeah, yeah, and that hit me in a surprising way. Yeah. Um, like them, like the flashback of them with the hollyhocks, which is just this paper boat that they pretended to be on in, right. in their yard. Um, there's one line that I referenced on the Patreon thing, patreon.com slash obsessive viewer, but, uh, young, uh, oh God, what is, what is Darla? Darla. Yeah. Uh, she says, there's a sea monster, but me and Lisi and Amanda got through it. um, just like that simple line mm-hmm. i was just like oh my god that is that's beautiful that's yeah. that's their sibling sibling energy their their quartet like i just <laughs> i love that i loved it totally i liked yeah. it too yeah yep um okay i think we've talked out Lisi's story mm-hmm. <laughs> overall i have one final question for you tiny okay uh having seen the entire mini series now does this do you think you will ever revisit the book no oh interesting i I really don't and i probably won't watch the series again either oh yeah um it was a good adaptation i don't think it would be like a top 19 adaptation okay maybe it's hard to tell i Mm -hmm. i'd have to look at the list of all the the master we really need to do that episode we we do um totally but I, i i'm leaning towards it not being there even though i do think just for the visuals alone, it was amazing and, yeah. and the great acting and, and solid writing. Um, I, I do think it's a very slow paced story mm-hmm. and it's not, not a ton of progression. There's so much backstory. It's yeah. half, I'd say two thirds of it is backstory and mm-hmm. that can be laborious. Yeah. Um, and it, and it kind of was, it was very laborious in, in the book to the point where it kind of took me out of it. Uh, de- definitely took me out of it, mm-hmm. and uh, it, it it was a little laborious at times in the watching the show, and, yeah. and I think it's it's just the nature of the story. It's not necessarily a flaw or a an error uh, in the writing or anything. It's just it's just mm-hmm. the way it's told, and it has to be yeah. told that way. And uh, it's it's just something you kind of have to get through or uh, experience. And and it's it, I think I think this show is going to be difficult for a lot of people. Even people who have read the book. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to be difficult. Um, and people who haven't read the book, I, I, I'm very curious to see how this lands with viewers. Yeah. If this, if this gets good ratings or, or if it gets good reviews, I'm, I'm really curious to see. Cause I, I have a feeling it's not going to be well reviewed. Yeah. By critics or fans. And mm. that's a shame because I'm not sure it deserves it. Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's kind of interesting because this is something I tend to do with like stuff that we review and everything. I haven't read any reviews for the season or for any of the episodes or anything. Okay. I'm, I haven't been like in tune with the, you know, the cultural conversation about it. Mm-hmm. But now that we have finished reviewing it um, <laughs> in as much depth as we can, um, I'm free to read reviews and, right. and listen to podcasts. Uh, that's that's not true. I did listen to uh, Kim C's reviews of the first two episodes. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, so, so now I'm going to kind of check it out. Cool. Um, all right. Well, I think that'll do it for this episode of Tower Junkies and our coverage of Lisey's story, the novel, and the show. Uh, look forward to when there's a manga and uh, comic series, and <laughs> I force Tiny to go on this journey again. Oh, boy. Um, so we are uh, in the past now. Uh, you guys are in the future. We're releasing this next Friday as of this recording. After this, we are going to be covering Needful Things, the novel, and then Needful, Needful Things, the movie. This is exciting because this is a listener listener choice mm-hmm. um, review double thing because I posted on Twitter, hey, what should we review uh, this year? And uh, you guys voted for Needful Things and then... Uh, also Dreamcatcher, but that'll be later this year, probably, hopefully. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so that's what's on the docket. And then eventually I think we're going to do a top 19 adaptations. Yeah. Um, mentally in my head, I don't know if we can keep the week to week pace, but if we do, um, the first ish week of August it will be, I don't know the exact date, but will be our, is this 
fucking true. The five year anniversary of Tower Junkies. Oh wow. Yeah. Oh god. Dang. Um. So maybe we can commemorate that with our top nineteen adaptations. Okay. Cool. Um. So yeah. So anyway, that's that's uh that's all to come at some point. But uh. But yeah. I hope that I'm gonna press the right button here. But um. That'll do it for this episode of Tower Junkies. Huh. Oh, that's interesting. I messed that up. Huh. Interesting. Okay. That'll do it for this episode of Tower Drunk Ace. <laughs> um, thank you guys so much for listening and for supporting us. Check out Patreon and our other podcasts as well. Um, yeah. So having said all that, thank you guys for listening. Long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. And now, here's a short clip from our Patreon-exclusive RSS feed. To hear the full clip and more exclusive Patreon content, go to patreon.com slash obsessiveviewer and become a patron at the minimum rate of $1 per month. Thank you and enjoy. I was in whatever class that was. Okay. um, And the, like... uh, I I really, really had to go to the bathroom. Okay. Like... Been there. It was like... I don't want to, uh, this is too gross. I don't want to say turtle head poking out, but mm-hmm. like, um, <laughs> mudslide imminent, <laughs> um, <laughs> which unfortunately is the title of this Patreon episode. <laughs> yes, it is. You have to do it now. God damn it. You have no choice. Um, and like, it was like, it was like, uh, like fight or flight yeah, response. Right. And so this is in the middle of a presentation that someone's giving. Ooh. And so like it's like you can't interrupt the presentation. It's like very you rude. can't. Yeah. It's very rude. And so I'm like, it's I, I'm I'm interrupting this one way or the other. And I would prefer it not to be the other. <laughs> so <laughs> one way or the other. <laughs> so Tower Junkies is edited and produced by Matt Hurt and presented by obsessiveviewer.com. For a full archive of our episodes, go to towerjunkiespod.com slash archive. You can also like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash towerjunkiespod and follow us on Twitter at towerjunkiespod. If you enjoy the show, please take a couple minutes to leave us a rating and a quick review on Apple Podcasts. This is the easiest way to support what we do, and all it costs is just a little bit of your time. If you'd like to donate to the podcast, you can make a PayPal donation at towerjunkiespod.com slash donate or support us on Patreon for recurring donations and access to commentary tracks and B-roll audio recorded exclusively for patrons at patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. Every donation goes toward paying the fees to keep the podcast running and is greatly appreciated. For official obsessive viewer merch, including shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more, visit our Tee Public store. You can find a link to the store in the show notes of this episode and at obsessiveviewer.com slash donate. Or you can simply search for Obsessive Viewer at tpublic.com. For information about our annual live event showcasing short horror films from local filmmakers, check out shocktoberinirvington.com. And for an archive of all our events, as well as news about potential future events, head over to obsessiveviewer.com slash live. For more podcast content, you can find our flagship movie and TV review and discussion show, The Obsessive Viewer Podcast, at obsessiveviewer.com and on Twitter at obsessiveviewer. You can also find Anthology, Matt's solo podcast covering The Twilight Zone, and other classic and contemporary science fiction anthology TV shows at anthologypod.com and OV Anthology Pod on Twitter. Finally, check out The Secular Perspective, Tiny's side project podcast which tackles current events and life's big questions from the perspective of secular hosts Chad and Amanda at thesecularperspective.com. Music for the podcast is provided with permission from Fingers T on YouTube. Additional bumper music is provided courtesy of As Good As It Gets, which can be found at facebook.com slash as good as it gets band. Thank you so much for listening. Long days and pleasant nights. Kitty!